One of the biggest mistakes we can ever make in life is to allow our circumstances to dominate our lives. Because when we do that, what we end up being is like like a forlorn cork bobbing around in an ocean. So I want to talk to you about your circumstances and how you can rise above them to live your life in victory for Jesus. Well, welcome again to Christianity Works as we continue in our series of messages called Your Road to a Stunning Life. Because I believe, in fact, I know as I read God's Word, that God wants you to live an absolutely stunning life. Now, I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about having a big expensive car in the driveway and and a big house and lots of money in the bank and and a yacht in the harbour. That's not what I'm talking about. Those things are all imposters. God wants the real thing for you. And the real thing is a stunning life that you live for Jesus Christ. Now, you may remember that last week we kicked off this series, Your Road to a Stunning Life, and we talked about the first three steps to actually living a stunning life. The first one was believing that God is who he says he is, just believing in God. Because when he does that, he gives us three things. Firstly, his approval. Secondly, the gift of eternal life. And thirdly, all the rewards and all the blessings that he wants to shower out on us through the rest of our lives. That's not a bad first step, is it, to living a stunning life. The second step we talked about was making Christ the cornerstone of your life, of putting Christ in the middle and arranging everything else in your life, every other thing that you think and say and do around Jesus, making him first. And the third was getting your priorities right. Remember what Jesus said, the most important thing is to love God with all that you are and to love your neighbour as yourself. If each action, if each decision is, is, is set against that measure, does it honour God? Does it show my love for God? And does it show my love for other people? All of a sudden, we'll start arranging around Jesus a beautiful, beautiful life, a stunning life. Jesus wants you to live a stunning life. Think about it. If God sent his son, if he loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you, to to be sacrificed on a cross, that gruesome death of being nailed hand and feet to a cross so that he would pay for your sins so that you could be forgiven and spend eternity with him. If he loves you that much, then, then what sort of a life do you expect he wants you to live? Do you think he wants you to live an awful life? Do you think he wants you to live a miserable life? Do you think he wants you to live a life in slavery? No, Jesus came to set you free. Jesus came to give you life in all its abundance. Jesus came so that you could live a stunning life. Well, what's the next step? What's the fourth thing in living a stunning life? The fourth thing I'd like to share with you today is for you not to allow your circumstances to dictate your life. Now, that's not easy. I mean, when someone you love dies, you're going to mourn. You're going to be sad for a time. When you go to work and you receive a promotion and a pay increase, you're going to be happy. You're going to want to celebrate. And there's nothing wrong with either of those two things. But sometimes we allow success and failure to, to fool us. Sometimes we experience failure and we think, well, I'm a failure. Or we experience success and we think, I'm fantastic. Both of those two things, success and failure, can end up dominating your life to such an extent that they rob you of the stunning life that God wants to give you. Just think about success for a moment. Let's imagine you win some prize or some race or some promotion um, or some accolades and people pat you on the back. It's nice when that happens, isn't it? It's nice when we're successful. But generally, those things only last for a short time. And even if success lasts for a long time, it loses its luster very quickly. It it stops being attractive and satisfying very quickly. I was a successful businessman, and and the business that I had before I sold it was able to make a lot of money. But 
through all that success, there was an emptiness. There was a lostness. There was a, a sense that there must be something more than this. Success doesn't define our lives. Similarly, I, I failed at things. In fact, probably half of the things I try don't work. In this ministry, I have an idea. We try something. Often it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, we learn and we discover and we try something different. But just because something doesn't work, just because we fail at something, doesn't mean that I am a failure. It doesn't mean that I've failed. Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called If Many Years Ago. It's a beautiful poem. And two lines of the poem are inscribed above the doorframe as the players walk out on the centre court in Wimbledon in London. And what those two lines say are this. If you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. Isn't it interesting? He calls triumph and disaster, success and failure, impostors. And they truly are. Neither of those things define who you and I are. Neither of those things define our lives. And if we allow those two things, success or failure, to dominate our lives, then we are not going to live a stunning life. If I'm always looking for success and recognition, I'll always be dancing to someone else's tune, won't I? I'll always be hoping that people like me and love me and, and, and pat me on the back. And that's a hard gig. That's hard work to keep that up. And if, if I allow this failure to stop me dead in my tracks, I'm, I'm not going to have a very, a very fun life, am I? I'm not going to be able to go out and do the things that God's made me to do and that God's called me to do. Success and failure are imposters. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we allow our circumstances to dictate our lives to us, the sooner we're going to be on a road to a stunning life. I'd like to use as an example, if you will, Jesus' own life. Jesus experienced worldly success and worldly failure, and yet neither of those two influenced his understanding of what God called him to do, and neither of those two influenced who he was and what he did. Come with me to the Bible. We're going to go to John chapter 2, beginning at verse 23. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in Everyone. So Jesus had this kind of rock star thing going on. Whenever Jesus came to a town or a region, people flocked and they shouted and they, they loved it and they, you know, they wanted to drag him off and make him king. Did, did Jesus allow that, that worldly success to influence him? No. He said he did, wouldn't entrust himself to anyone. And just as well, because just a few chapters later, in, in John chapter 6, beginning at verse 66, we discover, let's go to it please, John chapter 6, Verse 66, Jesus actually said some difficult things. And because of this, verse 66, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Imagine, crowds and crowds and multitudes and lots of people and success, so much so that the religious leaders of the day were, were hugely jealous of what Jesus was doing. They couldn't pull crowds that big. Sometimes 5,000 people sat down in a field. Well, if, if 5,000 people sat down in a field, that meant basically that town or that city or that region closed down while Jesus was there. He had this success, but it didn't stop him from saying the difficult things, the tough things, the hard things that people needed to know. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people stopped following him because they didn't like what he had to say. Jesus' allegiance was to tell them the truth from God. That's what he was called to do. Success was not what dominated him. It was what God had called him to do that, that was the most important thing to Jesus. And then, of course, just a few chapters later, we discover things turn from bad to worse for Jesus. John chapter 19, verses 16 to 18. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is the place called the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, as Jesus hung there, he, he was the biggest 
failure on the planet. All these miracles, all these crowds, all this worldly success. And now he was dead. He was gone. He was, he was treated like a common criminal and nailed to the cross. And yet, what looked like the biggest failure in all of history was in fact the greatest success in all of history because through that death on the cross, Jesus paid for my sins and he paid for your sins so that you and I could be forgiven and have the gift of eternal life. Do you see how when we look at Jesus' life through the prism of worldly success and failure, his life was something of a roller coaster. He had great successes and he had great failures in the world's eyes. And yet Jesus didn't worry about any of those. Because he was called to do something. He was called to get out there and to reveal the nature of God to you and me and to die on that cross to pay for our sins and to rise again so that you and I could have a new life and and to empower his disciples with the Holy Spirit so that they could kick off this new thing called the church that, that you and I too would receive forgiveness and the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus was on this earth to do those things. He didn't dance to the tunes of other people's ideas of success and failure. Friend, I want you to be set free from the success and the failure of this world today. I want you to be set free from the desire to be thought well of. I want you to be set free from from that terrible feeling of I'm a failure when you fail. You're not called to be a success or a failure. You are called to build your life around Christ as your cornerstone and to make every decision based on the priorities that he set for you, which is to love the Lord of God, your God, with all that you are and to love your neighbour as yourself. Some days you are going to have successes and some days you are going to have failures. That's just the way life's going to be. But you don't have to dance to those tunes. God wants you to live a stunning life. So get out there. Live that stunning life. When the the successes and the triumphs come, don't be seduced by them. When the failures come, don't be disappointed by them. Keep on keeping on and living your life for Jesus. Because Jesus wants you to live a stunning life. Now, I've been telling you over these last few weeks about a book that I've written called Your Road to a Stunning Life. I would love to send you a free copy of that book. It's not one of the usual booklets that I do, but a full book, because I know that when you receive the word of God in your heart, when you can mull over it and contemplate it and receive it, that God is going to lead you into the stunning life that he planned for you. Our contact details are on your screen right now. Please get in touch with us and request your free copy of my book, Your Road to a Stunning Life. And don't forget, if you're able to hop online, you can also have instant access to my e-devotional, some words of, of hope and encouragement delivered to your entry each and every weekday. So please get in touch with us and receive your free copy of my book. All right, we're talking about you living a stunning life. And just before the break, we talked about the fact that we shouldn't allow our circumstances, be they success or failure, to dominate our lives. Because worldly success and worldly failure aren't the final arbiters of what we're called to do. It's God that is. And God wants us to live a stunning life as we just faithfully follow after him step by step by step and honour him with every decision that we possibly can. And when we do that step by step, all of a sudden, we'll discover that we're building a stunning life. A life that impacts other people for good. A life that shares the love of Jesus Christ with other people. A life that demonstrates that love when we forgive people and when we sacrifice for people that don't deserve our sacrifices. Jesus wants you to live a stunning life. Right. The very next thing I want to share with you about this stunning life is that unless you are happy with you, then you can't live a stunning life. Low self-esteem is is happening around the world in plague proportions. So many people compare themselves with the images of success that the advertising industry throws up or, or the other people around them, and they come to the conclusion that they're not very clever or they're not very beautiful or they're not very smart or they're not very successful. You've done it and I've done it. And when we do that, we we start getting this view of ourselves that says, well, I'm actually no good. 
I, there's no value. I, I can't help anyone. I can't do anything. The, the fifth step to a starting life is for you to be happy with you. Let me ask you something. How do you react when you see yourself in a photograph? Are you one of these people that goes, oh, or, or how do you react when you see yourself in a video, that's even worse, isn't it? I remember the first time I saw myself on te television many, many, many years ago, I was horrified. I thought, that's, that's terrible. I, I look terrible. And how do you react if you hear your voice recorded and played back? I can tell you, when I first started producing radio programs back in 1998, I'd go into the studio and I'd record the programs and, and Max, my producer, would, would produce them up into radio programs. And I remember that sensation of the very first time I heard one of my radio programs, I was horrified. I thought, is that what I sound like? It, no, that's terrible. People will never want to listen to that. Have, have you had those sensations when you've seen yourself and you've gone, oh, that's awful? Now, of course, you see yourself every morning in the mirror when you get up and you're hardly at your best. Every word that you've ever spoken, pretty much, you have heard. And yet it's when we see ourselves or hear ourselves out there played back to us that we become horrified. Do you know why? Because we are really concerned about how we look or sound in other people's perspectives. We're concerned about what other people think about us. I used to think my voice was really odd. My, my voice didn't sound normal like the voices of all the other people around me. It's this terrible misperception that I'm no good. We've all experienced it. We've all gone through it. And, and if you're living with this, this self-esteem problem, you can't live a stunning life. If you don't have the quiet confidence and delight in who you are, you can't live a stunning life. You end up hurting, and hurting people hurt people. So, so let me ask you this. What do you think of you? When you hear yourself or see yourself or you, you see what other people say about you, how do you respond? Are you happy with who you are? Or are you desperately unhappy with who you are? See, one of the things that really fosters this sense of inadequacy is the advertising we see on television or in the magazines or on the billboards. Because what the advertising industry does is it sets up pictures and images of success. Uh, it says a woman has to look this way in order for her to be beautiful. And so the promise is that if the woman goes out and buys the makeup or the diet plan or the exercise plan or whatever it is, or the clothes or the shoes, if she buys those things, she will end up looking like that image. That's the brand promise. Of course, she never does because she can't look like that image because that image has been, been photoshopped and airbrushed and, and distorted in order to look like that. It's a false image. And so Advertising companies use that inadequacy gap between where we are and what their image of success is in order for us to buy their products. So we go and buy their products, it doesn't work, so they set up the next inadequacy gap and the next one and the next one and the next one. That's how it works. So you can see how the whole self-esteem issue, particularly when it comes to body image in women and in men, you can see how this whole self-esteem issue starts to get deeper and deeper and deeper and we start feeling less and less and less adequate. Inadequacy, low self-esteem is a cancer. And I believe that God's word can heal you of that cancer today. So will you please come with me to the Bible and let's have a look at Psalm 139 verses 13 to 18. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, our God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end and I am still with you. So, so what that's saying is that God was there when you were formed in your mother's womb. Right, right at the beginning, right, right when you were conceived, God was there in that place. And he was the one 
that lay down every strand of DNA, every gene, every chromosome, everything that you are, the very blueprint of who you are, was designed and produced by God. So he sovereignly chose who you are. He chose what gifts to give you and what gifts and abilities to give someone else. He chose your hair colour, your eye colour, the colour of your skin. He chose everything about you. So he didn't make a mistake. He didn't make you better or worse than the next person. He handcrafted you uniquely to be you. Who you are is the sovereign choice of the living God who created the universe. Does that make a difference? To me, that makes a huge difference. The way I sound, the way I look, the things I'm good at, the things that I'm not good at, are all the sovereign choice of the living God. You are uniquely handcrafted. And and not only are you made by him, but the psalmist says that every day of your life was written down in his book before any of them has yet existed. So who you are and what he called you to do are the design of God. And unless he made a mistake, which I don't believe he did, he made you to do specific things, to be a specific person capable of doing specific things. I think that's hugely liberating. That is so exciting because I don't have to be anyone else. I just have to be the best me that I can possibly be. And the psalmist says, how vast is the sum of these thoughts? How weighty are they? I count them, but they're more than the sand on the sea, on the ocean. The the psalmist is totally gobsmacked at the wonder of who God made him to be. And you and I have every right under the sun to be exactly the same. In fact, a long time later, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, gave us a little executive summary of this Psalm 139. The Apostle Paul said, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good things that God prepared beforehand for us to walk into. You are utterly unique. You are God's workmanship, God's handiwork. The same hands that flung stars into space, the same hands that were nailed to a cross, the same hands that that woodworked the wood in the carpenter shop in Nazareth are the hands that made you, and you are God's workmanship, created with a purpose, created to get out there and do the good things that God's already prepared for you to do, because every day that exists was written down for you in God's book before any of them as yet existed. I want you to be excited about who you are. I want you to be comfortable, entirely comfortable with who you're not. You and I cannot be everything to all people. You and I can't have all the gifts, all the abilities. So stop comparing yourself. Stop trying to be someone else. You can't live a stunning life if you're trying to be someone else. You cannot live a stunning life if you aren't happy with who God made you to be. You and I are not mistakes. You and I are the sovereign choice, the creation of the living God who loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. You've got such a stunning life ahead of you. Your gifts and your abilities and your motivations and all the things that you're good at and all the things that you're capable of doing are so valuable and precious in God's eyes because he made them. He gave you those gifts and he's called you to be you. Not that person, not me. God has called you to be you. So I want you to be excited about that. I want you to be excited about the stunning life that God has ahead for you. Stop this nonsense of comparing. Stop this nonsense of looking at other people and thinking that you're not good enough. God has a stunning life for you. Let me pray for you. Father, each one of us, we are your hand creation. You made us, Lord, and we thank you for that. Father, I pray by your spirit right now that you would fall on us, that you would take this word and put it in our hearts, and that you would give us a genuine delight for who you made us to be. I pray especially for people suffering from low self-esteem, that you would deliver them from that through your word and through your spirit this very day. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. May you be blessed as you receive God's word. And please get in there, get into God's word. Get into Psalm 139 verses 13 to 18, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, and let the word of God do a mighty, powerful work in your life. I'm going to catch you again next week as we continue our look at your road to a stunning life. Well, that's pretty much all we have time for. 
But I just wanted to remind you again that every day I write a devotional called Fresh. It's about helping you draw closer to Jesus by letting his word touch your heart in a practical, loving way, day by day by day. You can get your free subscription to The Fresh Devotion at freshdevotional.org. Just go across to that website, pop in your name and your email, and that will be winging its way to your inbox every day. God bless you as you receive his word. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works, and I'll catch you again the same time next week with another message of his love, his grace, and his power for each one of us in Jesus Christ. Hey, YouTube. If you are blessed through today's message, then click on this button and subscribe to the Christianity Works YouTube channel and continue being blessed and empowered through the Word of God each and every day.